In the non-singular matrix theorem, we saw that an n by n matrix A is invertible if and only if it's row equivalent to the identity, the identity matrix there. Now it turns out that the process of row reducing A into I can produce the inverse matrix uh, a it can produce the inverse matrix a inverse and this is going to come about from using elementary row or ele well so we get elementary row operations to convert a into i but we can also turn these elementary row operations into matrix multiplication using elementary matrices that we introduced in the previous video so let me explain that um, so let's suppose we have an invertible matrix a uh, so let a be an invertible matrix uh, we don't need to say A twice there, let A be an invertible matrix, then any sequence of elementary row operations that reduces A to the identity will also transform the identity into A inverse. So how are we going to do this? So we know by the non-singular matrix theorem, like I just mentioned, that if A is non-singular, it'll be, it'll be equivalent, row equivalent to the identity matrix. So there's some sequence of row operations that gets you there. So it's kind of like, okay, we get, uh, we have A, which we're gonna call it A0 for a second. We perform a row operation, we get A1. We perform a row operation, we get A2. And we do this, you know, we'll, we'll say we'll do this P times until we get AP, which that's the same thing as the identity matrix. So, so we have some sequence of row operations that does that. Now associated to each of these, uh, associated to each of these row operations is an elementary matrix, we're gonna call it E I, for example. And so what this tells us is the following that, well, A zero, that's just an A, right? A one, this can be factored as E one times A. A two, this can be factored as E two, E two times E one, A one. And then the next one, this would look like E three times E two times E one A. And we can continue down the line until we end up with the following. We get E P, times EP minus one, all the way down to E2, E1 uh, times A. And that this is supposed to equal the identity. And so that's what I'm trying to illustrate right here, that each row operation we perform can be rewritten using matrix multiplication where E, I is an elementary matrix. And so now we have this factorization of the identity matrix. But by redoing the parentheses, notice if we put all the elementary matrices together, we have a product, you know, let's say that the product of all those matrices, E, P, E, P minus one, all that way down to E1, let's call that matrix E for a moment, right? Then what we've said here is that E times A is equal to the identity, which means, hey, this guy right here must have actually been the inverse of A. So the product of all these elementary matrices is the is the, the inverse of A. So A has an inverse and we can find it by multiplying together these elementary matrices, all right? So how do we put that into an algorithm? Well, the theorem we just proved, which we call the inversion algorithm, it's a process, the, the algorithm is gonna be a process for computing matrix inverses. So consider the following situation. We have A augment the identity. So what we saw previously is that the, uh, we saw on the proof, just on the previous slide right here, that A inverse is the product of all these elementary all these elementary operations, right? And so notice if we take this, let, let's actually expound upon this for one more second. So if we take EP all the way down to E2, E1, and you times that by say the identity, which of course doesn't really do much, that gives you A inverse. So compared to what we saw earlier, right? Multiplying by elementary row op or by elementary matrices does a elementary row operation. If we take the same sequence, if we take the same sequence of elementary row operations that converted A into the identity, that same sequence of elementary row operations will take the identity into A inverse. And so if we take the augmented matrix A augment the identity, then the, when we row reduce A into the identity, this will row reduce the identity into A inverse. And so when in doubt, row reduce, that seems to be the solution to every linear algebra problem. So let's consider the three by three matrix A given as zero, one, negative three, one, negative two, five, and negative five, four, three. If we were performing row operations here, what would we get? Now, at this point in the series, I've been skipping over row operations a lot because 
this becomes quite elementary, but here, in this problem, I do want to emphasize it here because the elementary raw operations is the key, right? Um, so if we were to do some raw operations, what would we do? Our first pivot in the 1-1 one, one position, as indicated right here, has a zero in it. We want something else, a one would be great. So let's interchange rows one and two. This then puts a one in the pivot position. To get rid of the five below, we're gonna take row three and we're gonna replace it with row three plus five times row one. So we're gonna get a plus five, minus 10, plus 25, and a plus five. I ignored the columns that had zeros in them. And so then when we come down here, uh, negative five plus five is zero. Four take away negative 10 is a negative six. Three plus 25 is 28. Zero plus zero is zero. Uh, zero plus five is five. And zero plus one is one right there. Scroll up a little bit. So now we can move our pivot position to the 2, 2 position. We want to get rid of that negative 6 that's below the pivot. So we're going to take row 3 and add to it 6 times row 2 this time. So we're going to add 6. We're going to subtract 18. We're going to add 6. And then everything else is a 0. 6 minus 6 is a 0. Uh, 28 minus 18 is 10. 0 plus 6 is 6. Uh, 5 plus 0 is 5. 1 plus 0 is 1, right? Now that finishes the forward phase of our Gauss-Jordan elimination. Uh, the next thing to do is then to scale. So we're going to scale row 3 by 10. Uh, that makes 10 go to 1. That makes 6 go to 6 tenths, which is 3 fifths. Uh, 5 would go to 5 tenths, or 1 half. And then 1 would go to 1 tenth, like so. Now we want to get rid of the things that are above the pivot position. So to get rid of this 5, for example, we are going to take row... 1 minus from it 5 times row 3. So we get minus 5 minus 3. Uh, so this next one here, we have to get a minus 5 halves. And then the next one's going to be minus 1 half. If we work with the fractions there. 5 take away 5 is 0. 0 minus 3 is negative 3 right there. So you're going to take 1 minus 5 halves, which is negative 3 halves. And then 0 minus a half is negative 1 half there. Uh, next... Uh, we have to get rid of this negative 3 right here, so we should take row 2 plus 3 times row 3. You might have wondered, why didn't you just do both of those at the same time? Well, although we could have, um, I'm trying to emphasize step by step, what is that sequence of row operations here? So I am going to separate those two steps so that each step is one step along the way. So we're going to get plus 3. Uh, we're going to get plus 9 fifths, plus 3 halves, and then the last one there is going to be plus 3 tenths. So that will go to a 0. Uh, we're going to get 1 plus 9 fifths, which is 14 fifths. 0 plus 3 halves would be 3 halves, and 0 plus 3 tenths would be 3 tenths. And so we're almost there. The last thing to do is moving our pivot position back to the 2-2 two, two spot. Uh, we need to get rid of that negative 2. So we're going to take row 1 plus 2 times row 2 this time. So we get plus 2. Uh, we're going to get, uh, being careful here, 28 fifths. Uh, for this one, he, the next one, we're going to add six halves. Or if you prefer, we're just going to add three. And then for the last one, we're going to add six tenths. Or again, if you prefer, we could do three fifths. Uh, in the end, it's going to be the same. You're going to get the identity matrix over here. And then ne negative three plus 28 fifths. Um, let's see, three becomes 15 over five. And so that combines to give you 13 fifths positive. Uh, the next one, you're going to get three fifths positive. And then for the last one, you're going to get negative 5 fifths plus uh, negative 5 tenths plus 6 tenths, which is 1 tenth. And so in the end, we get it. And this right here is our inverse matrix. So we see that A inverse is going to equal 13 fifths, 3 halves, negative or 1 tenth, 14 fifths, 3 halves, 3 tenths, 3 fifths, 1 half and one tenth, like so. This is the inverse matrix. Now, if you want to, you could factor out a scalar of one tenth. Uh, that'll leave behind 26. Uh, the next one will be 15, one. Let me give myself a little bit more space to write this thing here. Uh, then the next row would be 28, 15 again, three. And then the last one would be six, five, and one. And so this would then give us our inverse matrix. If you like the whole numbers, you can factor out the tenth. You can't throw away the tenth because you need it. If you took A times just this matrix right here, you get tens along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. You need the one tenth. So if you prefer, you can write it like this. 
And don't be too worried that, oh no, the inverse matrix has lots of fractions. I'm so scared of fractions. Remember what's the whole point of inverse matrices? Inverse matrices, these are the reciprocal matrices. These are the matrices when you multiply by, will cancel out the multiplication by A. Essentially, multiplying by the inverse matrix is matrix division. When you divide whole numbers, you get fractions if things don't divide into things evenly. That's going to happen with inverse matrices. You're going to get fractions sometimes. It's not such a big deal. Now, you'll get fractions if you're working over the real numbers, complex numbers too. Nice thing about some of the finite fields we've looked at, like Z2, Z5, Z7, fractions are never actually necessary. Uh, in which case, you could then simplify these things in that regard, if you so chose. But the inversion algorithm is a very nice method for finding the inverse of a matrix. If you augment the, the singular non-singular matrix of the identity, you'll row reduce that to get the identity augment inverse right here. But what, what if A was a singular matrix? Well, then it won't be a row equivalent to the identity. You'll get something else. And so what's interesting about the inversion algorithm is the following. It's a decision problem, right? It can determine, is the matrix singular or non-singular? It can tell you, yes, it's singular, or yes, it's non-singular. It'll determine by that. If you get anything other than the identity in this spot of the matrix, that means it was a singular matrix. But in the case that it turns out to be non-singular, you'll also have the you also have the inverse matrix at hand. And so you could slam this into your favorite calculator and compute it, and then interpreting the REF here, you'll see, oh, identity matrix is non-singular. Here's the inverse matrix, yay! Or if it's like, oh, this wasn't the identity, then we can record that the matrix was in fact singular. It's pretty impressive and that this algorithm doesn't take anything more than just a few row operations.